praise you, Jesus. We worship you, Father. I just want you to stay in this attitude this morning as we, we enter the throne room of God. And the word says in Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 16 that we can enter into the throne room of God boldly so that you and I can obtain mercy and find grace in time of need. And I want you to imagine that you are now in the throne room of God and you are worshiping Him. What would you say to God if you were standing before Him this morning and you you could see His countenance and you could see His glory and His majesty. What would you say to Him? Would you raise your hands? What would you do if you're standing before the living God this morning? We honor you, Lord. We glorify your name. Thank you that you are our God. Thank you that you are in control this morning. Thank you, Father. Thank you that we can worship you, bring you honor and glory, and lift your name up high. The word promises us that when we lift his name up, he will draw all men unto him. Isn't that what you want this morning? To be drawn to the most high God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Father. Father, as we come into your presence this morning, we just want to say thank you. Thank you that you love us. Thank you that you gave your son to die on that cross of Calvary for each one of us. Irrespective of what we have done, irrespective of what we are, Jesus died for us. Yes. And this morning we want to honor you because of that. This morning we want to show you our gratefulness, our thankfulness because of what Jesus did for each one of us. And Father, as we enter this, this year of 2023, there's only 11 months left, Lord. But we want to put you in control of this year. We want to put you in control of our lives, our problems, our everything, oh God. We want to submit it before your throne this morning. We want to lay it down. Say, here am I, Lord. Use me. Use me for your honor and glory. Use me to build your kingdom. Use me to speak to my neighbor. Use me, Father. Are you willing this morning? Are you willing? We pray this in the precious name of Jesus. And everyone says... Amen. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Okay, this morning before I start, I've just got a short announcement to make. <clears throat> um, we've announced it in the past as a Bible school, but it's not really a Bible school. And uh, we had a meeting on, on Wednesday and we decided to call it the Workshop Enrichment School where we want to enrich your lives with the Word of God. Um, there's quite a number of people that have already expressed interest. Um, we're going to start with this enrichment school. On, there's going to be an orientation on the, fourth, uh, on the 7th of uh, February, and we're going to start then the next week on the 14th. At 6.30 in the afternoon, it will be here at the church, and it will last for an hour and a half. At 8 o'clock, we will be finished, and then you can, can go home. The uh, registration forms will be at the info desk or at the church office from Monday. Um, you can get them there and fill them in. And um, the subjects you have seen on the board. So if you're interested and you want to have your lives enriched with the Word of God, and you want to know more about the Word of God, then that's the place for you to be. It's going to be in English. <laughs> I was waiting for ah or yay. <laughs> English is the heavenly language, you know. <laughs> Afrikaans came in the back door somewhere. I don't know how it slipped in, but the Lord allowed it. <laughs> for some other reason. Maybe because he's God. <laughs> 
going to be on Tuesday afternoons, as I said, from half past six until eight o'clock. So we're looking forward to see you there. All right, if there are any questions, you can speak to me afterwards. Um, or any of the pastors for that matter. Now this morning I want to speak to you about something that uh, is very near and dear to my heart. And I don't know how Stephen knew or the one who chose the songs knew what I was going to speak about. But they fit in perfectly with what I'm going to speak about this morning. And I've, I've, I've um, called my sermon, Who is in Control? And as you sit here this morning, I want you to think about that. You know, when someone asks you who is in control, it's easy for us to say, God. Really? Really? Is he really in control? Let me ask you a question. When you get into, a trouble, or into trouble or into a situation where things don't go your way, what do you do? Do you try and sort it out yourself in your own strength? Do you moan about the problem? About how unfair the world is? Do you blame others? Or even better, do you blame God? Now don't sit there and look at me all holy. I've done it before. I'm sure it, most of you have done it. Do you exhaust your own strength and then run to God? Or when the problem hits you, do you take that problem straight to God? Now, you don't have to answer me, but just think about it. If you take the problem immediately to God, then who's in control? God. All the other five instances I've mentioned is you are in control in some measure. Now, in my... Christian walk when I was still a young Christian God taught me something and I want to I want to give it to you this morning and you know when people make these statements they have to write the name of the person who made the statement well this is Harry Hundle's statement and it goes like this you, you can put it up Lisa if you have a problem and you cannot turn it into an opportunity for God you really have a problem That's what God taught me as a young Christian. If you have a problem and you cannot turn it into an opportunity for God, you really do have a problem. Because then you want to be in control and then you want to sort it out. And you don't trust God enough to give Him the problem and allow Him to sort it out for you. Now I want to turn your attention to a story in Exodus and I think you've heard this many times before. Just to show you what happens when God is in control. If you've heard it before, I just want to remind you again. And the background to the story is, is the Israelites were slaves to the, to the Egyptians. And God called Moses at the burning bush. You can remember the story. Then there were the ten plagues. And then Pharaoh decided that he was going to let the, the Israelites go. And then they were in the, in the wilderness following Moses. But the crux of the matter was that the Israelites had to do everything that God told them to do so that he could be in control. The Israelites had to do everything God commanded them to escape the death of their firstborn. You remember the firstborn that died? And in the same way, you and I have to adhere to the word of God for us to escape spiritual death and to get through 2023. Listen to me this morning. In your own strength, you're not going to make it through 2023. You're not going to make it. Maybe you're sitting there and you're saying, Harry, I'll show you. Well, I dare you. Show me. In Exodus chapter 13 from verse 21, it reads, it reads like this. It says, And the Lord went before them by day in a pillar of cloud to lead the way, and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light. So as to go by day and night. God led these people with his presence. The Israelites had to do everything God spoke to them. 
And only then could they rely on him to intervene and save them from the circumstances. And in much the same way, God leads you and I by his Holy Spirit through 2023. If you would only allow it, God will, will lead you by his Holy Spirit through 2023. Verse 22 says, And he did not take away the pillar of cloud by day or the pillar of fire by night from before the people. God was always there with them when they did what he told them to do. When they gave him the problem, immediately when it came, not trying to sort it out themselves first. Now, when we had the, the meeting with the men on Friday, six o'clock in the morning, Stephen said that he felt that God had told him that we need to get back to basics this year. And when he said that, immediately my spirit gelled with what he said. We need to get back to basics. We don't need these airy-fairy things. We need to get back to the basics of God. And, and here are some of the basics of God. There are quite a few more, but I just want to highlight these um, because it suits the sermon I'm doing this morning. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, man, you need to read the whole of 1 Thessalonians 5 to get the full impact, but I haven't got the time. 1 Thessalonians 5.16 says, what? Rejoice always only when it's going well. When? Always. Rejoice always. The Afrikaans, I looked it up. In the 53 vertalen. That say, Jibel altijd. Jy weet wat beteken jibel. Ek is nie so seker nie, maar ek dink dit beteken rejoice. Ja. <laughs> Verse 17. What's it? When? When you feel like it. In the morning. At night. When? Pray without ceasing. For jylle boerkies. Sonder ophou. This is the basics. When you're a when, when a problem comes your way, do you pray? What's the first thing you do? We try and solve it ourselves, don't we? It says, pray without ceasing. Verse 18 says, in everything, give thanks. Only when it's going well? No. In every situation you can put in there, give thanks. For this is the will of God concerning you. People always tell you, I don't know what the will of God is concerning me. There it is, my friend. In every situation, it doesn't mean, it doesn't say for every situation. It says in every situation, give thanks for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. These are the basics. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing. Now, in Exodus chapter 14, verses 1 and 2, I haven't got it yet, but I'm just going to tell you that God told Moses to tell the Israelites explicitly where they needed to camp by the Red Sea. Because he knew that they had to cross the Red Sea sometime. And if they did not camp there where God told them to camp, they wouldn't have crossed the Red Sea when the Egyptians came. What has God spoken to you through his word? For 2023. Have you got a word for 2023 from God? If you haven't, I would suggest that you get one. Go on your knees before God and seek His face. And say, Lord, what is your word for me and my family this year? So that when things go wrong, that you've got an anchor to hold on to. A promise that God has given to you and your family. Has God spoken to you through His word? through his pastors, through his spirit. And have you obeyed that instruction? Have you in obeyed that calling? And I'm not saying here by calling that you need to be a pastor. By calling, I mean, have you gone to that person that God told you to go to, to make right? 
Have you gone to that person to ask for forgiveness? Have you gone to that person to make right with them? To lead them to Christ? To give them that word that God has instructed you to give them by His Holy Spirit? Or were you afraid of failure? Yes, no right, that's still even now. Were you afraid of failure? Because if you are afraid of failure, who's in control? You. Not God. You see, God is more interested in obedience than your success. And I didn't coin that phrase. God is more interested in your obedience than your success. Obedience is better, better than sacrifice, the Bible says. You see, we are more concerned with recognition rather than obedience. I did this. God doesn't want that. He wants obedience. Obedience brings blessing. Merely believing in God does not. And why do I say that? Because in the Bible, there's a rich young ruler. I don't know if you remember the story. He came to Jesus and he said to Jesus, what must I do to be saved? And Jesus said, you must adhere to the law and you must keep all the commandments. And he says, but I'm already doing that. And then Jesus said to him, because he was a rich man, go and sell all you have. Give it to the poor and come follow me. And he couldn't. You see, he was already believing. He knew who Jesus was. But he couldn't obey. He didn't want to sell everything he had and give it to the poor. Because it was all about success for him. The Israelites were obedient to what God told them through Moses. And look what happened. Exodus chapter 14 verses 3 and 4 says, For Pharaoh will say of the children of Israel, They are bewildered by the land. The wilderness has closed, in, has closed them in. Verse 4 says, Then I will harden Pharaoh's heart so that he will pursue them, and I will gain honor over Pharaoh and over all his armies, that the Egyptians may know that I am the Lord. That who may know? The Israelites. Who may know? The Egyptians. God says to them, I'm going to use Pharaoh to show them that I am your God. And in the same way, God is saying to you, in 2023, if you will be obedient to my word, I will show your problems that I am God. Amen. And look at the last part of the sentence. They were obedient. And they did so. They went and camped where God told them to camp. I will use Pharaoh. To show you who is in control. And then in Exodus chapter 14 and verse 10 it say, um, says this. And when Pharaoh drew near the children of Israel lifted their eyes. And behold the Egyptians marched after them so they were afraid. And the children of Israel cried after the Lord. They were afraid. They didn't trust God anymore. With the first instance that a problem arised. They didn't trust God anymore. They, they feared. And verse 11. Um, Verse 11 says this. Then they said to Moses, Because there were no graves in Egypt, have you taken us away to die in the wilderness? Why have you so dealt with us to bring us out of Egypt? So now they start complaining to Moses. And they start blaming Moses for their problem, as if Moses forced them out of the promised land, uh, out, of the, out of Egypt. Don't we do the same when things go wrong? Remember when I started off? I asked, do we blame God? Do we blame other people when things go wrong in our lives? Why don't we do what 1 Thessalonians 5.18 says? In all situations, give thanks to God, for that is a, His will concerning you. Look at verse 12. Is this not the word that we told you in Egypt saying, this is the, the Israelites talking to Moses, let us alone that we may serve the Egyptians for it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than we should die in the wilderness. 
Can you believe this? They have just seen the firstborn of all the Egyptians die. Moses led them out of Egypt because of all the miracles that God did. And here they say, leave us in Egypt. You should have left us there so that we could die. Because it's your fault, Moses. You brought us out. Now, I want to, you know, when I, when I, uh, um, when I read these things, my mind wants to know why. But listen, the Israelites were slaves in Egypt. They were treated the worst. They lived in the slums. They ate the worst food. They were treated as slaves. They wore the worst clothes. And yet every time something goes wrong, they want to go back there. To that mess. To, that, to the slavery that they were in. Moses, on the other hand, Grew up in, in the, in the um, palace of Pharaoh. He wore the best. He rode the best. He slept on the best. He had the best education. He grew up in the house of the richest and most powerful man on the face of the earth that there was at that time. And whenever there's a problem, you never hear Moses wanting to go back to Egypt. Why? Why? I'll tell you why. Because Moses had an encounter with God at the burning bush. He met with God. And he was so inspired by what he saw in God. That he never wanted to go back to slavery. And if you want to get through 2023. We're going to have to get back to the basics. Where every morning you read. You spend time with God. You read the word and you pray. And you have an encounter with God. Because without that encounter, you will want to go back to slavery every time it gets too difficult. But if we have an encounter with God, those things are not going to worry us much. Because the Bible says that you and I are more than overcomers through Jesus Christ who died for us. Moses had an encounter with God. And then in Exodus chapter 14 and verse 13, it says, And Moses said to the people, Don't be afraid. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will accomplish for you today. For the Egyptians who you see today, you shall see again no more. Forever. God says, Stand still. And look at what I'm going to do for you in 2023. You will see your problems no more. Forever. If you do what I tell you to do. See the, Egypt, the Egyptians you see here. God was saying to the Israelites. You will never see them again. God will remove them from the face of the earth. Is not this what God will do to our problems. When we are obedient to him in tough times. Is not this what God will do to your marriage. If you have problems in your marriage. And when you have problems with your children. And when you have problems with your finances. And God will do this in every area of our lives if we are obedient to Him. Look at Exodus 14 and verse 14. It says, And the Lord will... What? For who? For you. And you shall hold your peace. Moses says to the Israelites, Stand here, fold your arms and shut up, and watch what God will do for you. And the same is true for you and I. All we need to do is to be obedient. The Lord will fight on our behalf. You won't even have to speak. All you need to do is to look. 2 Chronicles 20 verse 15 says, The battle is the Lord's and the victory is ours. And that's a good place for you to say amen. This is what God does for the Israelites and he will do it for us. In this coming year. And then in Exodus chapter 14. Verses 19 and 20. It says. And the angel of God who went before the camp of Israel. Moved and went behind them. And the pillar of cloud went from before them. And stood behind them. Verse 20 says. So it came between the camps of the Egyptians. And the Israelites. 
When the Egyptians came too close to the Israelites, God moved His presence from in front of them to in between them. He separated the Israelites from the problem with His presence. So if you trust God enough and if you are obedient to what He tells you to do, when there's a problem, He will go and stand in between you and that problem. He will put Himself there because the Word says that He fights our battles on our behalf. If you allow Him. You see, if we, when problems come and we try to sort it out ourselves, we are telling God, we don't trust you. We don't think you're good enough. I'll do it on my own. And then He removes Himself. But when you run to God, when the problem hits you, He will put Himself in between you and the problem. And He will fight your battles on, on your behalf. So what do you want in this year? Verse 21, Moses stretches out his hand and the Red Sea opens up. And you know the story. The Israelites cross on dry ground. And then uh, verse 28 says the following. Verse 28, Lisa. <clears throat> I want you to notice what God does in verse 25. Remember, He's now in between the Israelites and the Egyptians. Look at this. And He, that's God, took off their chariot wheels so that they drove them with difficulty. And the Egyptians said, Let us flee from the face of Israel, for the Lord fights for them against the Egyptians. Did you see this in the Bible before? God comes, He takes off the wheels from the chariots. Can you believe that? So that the Egyptians know that the God of the Israelites are fighting on their behalf. This is the God that you and I serve, man. Come on, church. Don't you think it's time that we allow Him to take over and to be in control? Let's go to um, verse 28. Okay, verse 31. Israel saw the great work which the Lord had done in Egypt. So the people feared the Lord and believed the Lord and His servant Moses. So Israel saw the work that the Lord had done. And all of a sudden, they in love with God and they feared God and they loved His servant Moses. Until the next problem came. Until they got hungry. Then they shouted at Moses again. Why did you not leave us in Egypt? And then they were hung, uh, thirsty, do you remember? Why didn't you leave us in Egypt so that we could die there? Every time a problem comes, they want to go back to Egypt. Why? Because they haven't had an encounter. For themselves with the most high God. Now I want to ask you this question. Was God there to solve the problem. When the Israelites needed food and water. In the desert. Was he there? Of course he was there. Was God there when Joshua had to take Jericho? Of course. Was God there when the, the Moabites and the Edomites and the Ammonites came to make war against the Israelites. When Jehoshaphat was king. He was there. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, when they were cast into the fiery furnace, was God there? Of course. Daniel was thrown into the lion's den. Was God there? He was there. When John the Baptist was beheaded, was God there? When Peter was crucified upside down, when Jesus was crucified, was God there? Of course He was there. There comes a time when you need to say, Not my will be done, but Thy will be done. Lord. Elizabeth, any questions? Now I want to ask you this morning, and I want to give you a little bit of my testimony to show you that it's not just in the Bible. It happens in real life. Is God really in control? I have found out that God is in control. 
Even when it seems that God is nowhere to be found. Even when everything is falling to pieces around you. Even when nothing seems to go right. Even when you think that God is not hearing you, your prayers. Even when there is no food on your table and no money in your pocket and no roof over your head. Even when you start doubting that there is a God. And every one of those, those instances that I've, I've noted there, I've been there. I'm going to ask you again. Is God still in control? I'm standing here this morning to tell you that God was in control. He is in control now. And He is in control in the future. Go and read the book. He's in control in the future. It's going to happen the way He says it's going to happen. Not what the world wants. Not what the Antichrist wants. The way God says it's going to happen. He's in control, my friend. You don't have to understand it. You don't have to agree with it. You don't have to believe it. All you need to do is to know that God is in control. And to live like God is in control. Listen to me. You can afford to opposite, Lisa. My son Lester graduated to heaven. And we didn't call it a funeral service. We called it a graduation service. Because we believe that he graduated from heaven, uh, from earth to heaven the day that he died. On the 22nd of February, 2008. It's about 14 years ago. It's something that shook our family to the core. And through this, the devil nearly stole our daughter. And I spoke about it a little while ago. Now you might ask me, was it a senseless waste of a young life? I think so. Was I afraid when it happened? Yes, I was. Did I understand it? No, I didn't. Did I agree with it? No. I didn't want my son to go. Do I believe that God is in control? You can bet your bottom dollar. I believe that God is in control. And when we read in Exodus chapter 13 from verse 21 or Exodus chapter 14 verses 3 and 4 it says, For Pharaoh will say of the children of Israel they are bewildered by the land of wilderness and closed in and then I will harden Pharaoh's heart so that he will pursue them and I will gain honor over Pharaoh, over all the armies, that the Egyptians may know that I am God. And yet I'm standing, being faced with this problem. And I'm saying, God, how are you going to show yourself as God in this situation? You see, previously I had, I had failed God many times. But I purposed in my heart that this time I wasn't going to fail Him. I was going to live like He was in control. See, in, in uh, 1993, God gave us a prophecy. Not to say that Lester would die. But to say that he would, he would give us another child for Jenny to look after. To fill the gap. Fifteen years before my son died, he gave us the prophecy. That young man is 14 years old. It's called Morgan. You see, if you are obedient to God, He will come through for you. Even though you don't understand it. Even though you don't know why these things are happening. He will come through for you. All you need to do is to be obedient. 1 Thessalonians 5 says, 
Give thanks. Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. My friend, I stood in the back of the church. I couldn't sing the songs because the emotions were too great. But I would raise my hands to God while the tears were running down my face. Like they are now. I purposed in my heart to praise God despite the circumstances, despite the fact that my son is not there anymore because he did it for the, for the Israelites, for the Egyptians. He did it for the Israelites when Jehoshaphat was king. And if he did it for them, he will do it for me. And if he did it for me, he will do it for you. Do you believe that? Is God in control? Let me ask you this morning. Do you need God to remove the wheels from your problems? Do you need God to step into the situation for you? I don't know what your situations are. I don't know if you've lost a child or not. Do you need God to remove the wheels? You see, God uses the authorities and He uses situations to get us to the place that He wants us to be. When Lester died, the church was too small for all the people. When Lester died, 200 young people, or more than 200 young people, gave their lives to Christ. That day. Now I don't know if that's why G Lester had to die. I don't. But two, more than 200 young people gave their lives to Christ. Including his grandfather, my father. And one of his uncles. And if you look at the, the Egyptians. If you would arrive in Egypt and you'd see how these people are treating the Israelites. Wouldn't you say to God, you need to do something because they're going to kill your people. And God says, I'm doing something. I'm going to show the Egyptians my power through Pharaoh. If you would arrive at the crucifixion where Jesus was being crucified with God, wouldn't you want to, want to grab God by the arms and say, God, you need to do something. They're going to kill your son. God says, I'm, I'm doing something. I'm saving the world. You see, God is in control. It doesn't matter what you and I think. God is in control. 